Hello YouTube. Good afternoon. Cool, damp Wednesday afternoon with church bells here again. They never stop, you know. I think there's a guy in that bell tower who watches out for me and says, oh, he's there again. Get the bells going, you know. Anyway. Smoking some Tillerman, H.U. Tobacco Tillerman. A sort of chocolate and nuts flake. Very nice. Lovely tobacco. Befitting the topic, Federation Tampa and a Federation Lighter. The Fermi Paradox and My Phenomenon. I thought I'd whet your appetite a little bit in thinking before I do my gore video so this is a kind of uh, precursor if you like for the uh, penultimate video before my 500 sub gore video and I wanted you to think about um, the Fermi paradox well uh, many of you know what it is Um, Enrico Fermi, back in 1950, had lunch with the American physicist Edward Teller in Los Alamos and basically said, uh, where is everybody? Uh, the lunch discussion was about all the UFO sightings in the early 50s and uh, Fermi was saying, well, you know, if they're really out there, we should we should find um, astronomically and radio signals and irrefutable proof and not just sightings that ever and again can't really be uh, hardcore corroborated at least at that time and since then many many uh, sightings later I suppose one could still make this argument although there are so many things on video cameras of uh, sightings but you it never really proves it and the big proof astronomically in terms of finding another wow radio uh, radio antenna signal that, that uh, was found in the late 60s but never repeated is we haven't been able to sort of really nail anything down that there are technological we call intelligent civilizations out there so it was a kind of paradox because um, the distillation of the lunch discussion was either our understanding of the universe and expectations for intelligent life are are out of whack um, or we're making errors in our observations maybe some of these sightings were real and indeed there is kind of proof out there but most of us aren't aware of it or or uh, it's been dismissed as erroneous so a contradiction of two logical positions um, or conflicting information or partial information on both sides uh, means it's unresolved, it's a paradox, it's contradictory. Now, uh, 1961, Dr. Frank Drake came along and he said, well, you know, let's put this into an equation with probability factors. And you see in this slide those listed out.
So he tried in these individual um, probability factors to weigh it out, the chances of intelligent life, and chances of a planet that w could harbour life, at least always in the framework of something similar to us. It's the only real life, carbon-based life, that we, we understand, and, and so on. Um, and based on this equation, you can come out anywhere between the universe is teeming with life to the universe is ultimately diluted so much that um, you'll never find it, or they'll never find you, depending on the assumptions you make, because each of those factors are basically things, things that you can only conjecture that you can make estimations of and the estimations are multiplied together linearly in the equation you could even say some factors are more important than others and should be raised to a power so so very quickly that equation takes from a hundred percent probability rapidly down to uh, very minuscule figures um, and because there are so many conjectures and, and assumptions and um, estimations in it you can really argue it's a nice equation but um, it's not really going to give you the, the insight my personal view this is just my personal view is uh, perhaps a little controversial because I want to believe the universe is um, teeming with life and being a Trekkie and all the rest of it that maybe in my lifetime or certainly in the next 50 or 100 years that we will encounter some of these species. I have no doubt that we will find simple life out there in our own solar system such as bacteria for example. But my real beef with the Drake equation is the last factor, the L. And L gives the longevity in which a civilization exists and can communicate. And that's where I have uh, my reasons for thinking we are a very rare um, existence in our galaxy, certainly. And, uh, even our galaxy is, is a 200 billion stars, uh, let alone the universe with all the other galaxies. Um, and that is because uh, mankind in any kind of uh, upright walking ape has only been around, what, 100,000 years perhaps, something like that. I'm not an anthropologist, but already 30,000 years ago we had uh, other human species around, up right, walking, using tools, let's say, about 50,000 years before that, then all the cave paintings and indications of some kind of thinking uh, ape become very rare or there are none beyond that point. A hundred thousand years start to look like um, Java man and uh, more like apes than, than humanoids. A hundred thousand years is nothing in the time scale of the universe. The universe began about roughly 14 billion years ago, may go on for almost effectively for all time, uh, at least another, let's say, 100 billion years. And if you start to divide things like 100,000 years into that uh, part of the equation, it becomes a, a fraction of a second before midnight and not even that. Um, so the period that we are here, and technological, let's say, 
So, in terms of real science and technology, it's just a couple of hundred years, best case, you know. In terms of anything electronic or whatever, you may as well just take it back a hundred years. That is nothing. And my point is that um, there may be other civilizations out there in the future. And there may well be, in our galaxy, other civilizations as intelligent and technological as, as us in the past. But not right now, when we are here. Because that is not even a heartbeat. That is uh, such a fraction of time. And then the question is, how long will our technological uh, civilization last? How long will our civilization last? You really think mankind, our technology here on Earth, a thousand years would be an immense time, wouldn't it? And that's also nothing. And when might our civilization end? If we don't leave the Earth and the Earth becomes hostile to our life because of overpopulation, disease, famine, all these things that have often wiped out most civilizations in our past within a few thousand years. No civilization that we know of, the Romans, the Greeks, the Mayans, have ever existed probably more than a few thousand years. So that's my, my problem, my paradox. Uh, I, I think of course, there will be life out there in the future, in the past, but the chance that they're around when we are here, at at least our technological level, may be even far more advanced. And how long did their civilization last to overlap with ours? So, what I would like you to think about and the question I will, will ask you, but this video is just to get you thinking about it. I mentioned at the beginning there have been observations of UFOs. Have you ever seen one? Or have you had some kind of encounter of the third kind? Or maybe someone you know has a story on that that you believe or maybe you've just experienced something strange which indicates there should be something intelligent out there in space that's visited us I would like to know in a video reply your story and because it's something profound to think about I will wait the video replies three to one. I will also have the opportunity for people to say I'm in. Again, this is not to put there in this video. The next one I do will give you all the details, the prizes and everything like that. But just to kind of whet your appetite. I'm putting on some Space Journey music which I got off YouTube. Which I forgot to press the button on should come on now. Well, what about my own story? If I'm asking you to open up on that topic, and I can understand for some people it might be a bit sensitive and personal because sometimes strange stories are... Uh, they exist and they're true, but not everyone wants to, let's say, make them public fear of being laughed at or whatever. I certainly won't laugh at anything. I'm interested in what people have experienced and we're just sharing here as we do in YTPC openly about many things. Well, my story, a few months ago, something happened to me. And it happened once when I was in, in my youth, uh, at about 13. 
And the odd thing is now it's happened twice. And it was a bit like this. Well, here's the thing. The first time it happened to me, I was a very uh, average, not particularly good student at school. And after that event, I moved up two or three gears. It came for those local school levels almost one of, one of the top students, but um, not brilliant, I don't think, and, and, uh, but quite clearly I surprised my parents and my siblings by all of a sudden um, leaping to, to such a high academic performance, and that followed me in my, my life and career. About three months ago, I went for a very late walk uh, up the hill here. It was a clear sky. Venus was very bright and um, decided to go for a nice walk up, up the hill. It was, um, Maybe about 11, 11.30, it got quite dark by then. Very nice view of the stars. And of course I was uh, looking around because I have an interest in astronomy. And the same thing happened again, when I was looking up stars and one caught my eye, a slightly brighter yellowish star and for some reason I was staring at it and the same thing happened, it started to move. Great, the bells have stopped. In any case, um, and I sort of picked myself up off the floor. I noticed some things that have changed. Well, let me show you exactly what I mean. So. Hello YouTube, here we are in my familiar setting, but to, today it's a little bit of a different um, mini video here because I'm doing a few tests on my table here on the balcony about moving objects uh, which shouldn't be movable. Um, so, Let's start with my little plastic ball here, right? Which is basically not um, any kind of, uh, it's not magnetic or anything like that. I put the uh, camera down to a, a low level, hands free, right? You know, nothing in them. I have some degree of control. The left hand seems to be better than the right. Nothing in it. And I can move this plastic ball wherever I want. This is a granite table, so um, there's, there's no tricks I can do through or under the table. 
You know, why don't you have a look here, you know? Because gra granite is uh, impermeable to magnetic fields. It's actually a lot of iron in granite. So that shouldn't be an issue. So I don't think it's magnetic and I don't think it's I don't think it's static. Plastic could be static, that's true, you know. That's true. So uh I thought pick something familiar, a new pack of um stand walls filters brand new pack here you know I mean these are uh, these are made of paper and charcoal and ceramic caps I mean there's nothing there's, there's just nothing magnetic about them so that should definitely be not something I can uh, fudge, you know, but there you are, you see. It's a little lighter, not being a ball, of course, it's uh, a little harder to move, but not in my hands at all. I was hoping Magician Piper could maybe come up with some explanations here, I don't know. I mean this is just paper and ceramic and there's a bit of uh, charcoal in there, I mean what, what, or taking something else from a pack of shallow pads. You know, what about a sharrow pad? You know, that's chalk. That's absolutely not magnetic. You know, do you see that? So it's a little harder to, for some reason, I don't know, maybe there is a permeability of uh, field which is less affected by chalk. There, you see it turned. There we are. So it's not very powerful. It's it's it, the ball is uh, very frictionless with this table, so it doesn't take much force to move it around. See, it's spinning. So it's not a very powerful force at the moment, but I notice that it's spinning. You see. easy to affect it. Um, but much clearer here with this plastic plastic ball. So that's my phenomenon I guess. Very curious and kind of curious where it will where it'll all end up. We'll see, I guess. Well, not only that, 
strange things happening with objects. Um, also the rate at which I read and learn and um, I've been through more books in the last three months than I have in my life. It's only limited by the time I can actually stay awake and um, download stuff to look at uh, on the net. Well you take for example um, my musical talents which were never strong. Um, have a look at this. Well I'm uh, down in our spare room and uh, here is our electric piano. Um, my wife still plays on this sometimes and I very rarely play on it. I used to play a bit in my youth, uh, even classical music, but very uh, badly. Um, I used to like Chopin because I found that a little bit uh, easier. And one master that I never would uh, properly attempt would be um, Johann Sebastian Bach because of its counterpoint challenge and uh, the coordination between left and right hand just overwhelmed me. So what I'm about to do here should be completely impossible. Um, now I've uh, got some sheet music here which uh, I'm using uh, and I've chosen the Prelude number no. 2 in C minor, Bach Werken uh, 847, which is quite a challenging piece that should make it doubly impossible. Um, and uh, for the first time ever, uh, this piece of music will be played while I'm smoking a pipe. I'm not sure if anyone's done that before. At least not publicly. This is a nice uh, Savonelli Trevi in um palm shape, so I can have both hands free to play the piano. Perfect. Let's get it lit. And in the pipe I have Edward G. Robinson because he was a gentleman and um, a man of style and surely loved classical music, especially Bach, I'm sure. So this can only be a disaster, but here we go.
see pipe smokers do it better I'm sure it's something to do with the blends that I've been smoking you know anyway it's just a story and do take my story with a pinch of salt but I'd love to hear your story however it is or something that you've heard about in a video reply next video is the gore video don't miss it take care everyone look after yourselves cheers bye bye